My name is Simon Brown, doing this evening's presentation. A uh, quick bit of housekeeping before we start. Power hour, operative word being, well, power and hour, uh, will be done sharply 6.30. That's it. I don't go back to Josie until the weekend sometime, so we can certainly take questions thereafter. But I do want to finish on time. Uh, there is, of course, a disclaimer. If you make money, it's yours. If you lose money, no longer yours. But don't, don't phone your lawyer because you have no money. Um, so, so this evening we're looking at when to sell long-term investments. And, and I, I want to caveat up front that we are talking investing here as distinct from uh, trading, of course. Uh, the clearest point line in the sand for investing is the three-year rule uh, as per SARS. If you hold for more than three years, it's considered a capital gain rather than income and therefore taxed accordingly. So we're talking the long-term stuff um, and therefore not derivatives, etc. And the reason why I want to touch on this is because we talk Lots, and I say we, I use the, the royal we as an industry. We talk lots around the concept of uh, you know, what to buy, how to know what to buy, what price to pay, how to put together a portfolio, and all of this is really lacquer. But what happens when it's time to sell? And the truth of the matter is, is, is I, if I look at my proper long-term portfolio, which I call my till death do us part. And the logic is simple. I own those shares until I die or they die, uh, whichever happens first. I have sold perhaps four shares ever in that portfolio. Um, some of them were very good sales, uh, pick and pay in 2003, uh, Nedbank in 2000. Um, some of them were very bad sales, SAB Miller in 1998. Uh, being the most notable of the, the bad sales, um, and British American Tobacco a couple of years ago as well. So I want to focus on on that part of, of, of uh, when do we exit. We do have content. We have done power hours before, looking at how we find those particular stocks, links up there, um, and then how we find the valuation for those shares so that we're paying a reasonable price for them rather than overpaying, because your entry price is one of the key things that we can control. Uh, we, we, you know, everything else is once you're in that stock, once you've paid for it, it's out of your hands until you potentially exit it. Um, so really what we're looking at is buying those, those uh, quality stocks, holding them through thick and thin, as long as they remain quality. And that's what I mean by that death to us part. And the key point here, so I'm not, I, when I'm buying, I care about the price because I can control it. Once I own it, the price is of lesser interest to me. And the, and the reason why the price is of lesser interest to me is twofold. Firstly, because you know, during the course of a share, it will fluctuate, but I will receive dividends and get paid in dividends. And I have a number of shares I've held for the long term where my dividends that I receive now exceed the price paid for the share way back in the day. So you get those dividends. It's also at this point in my life, I don't need that portfolio to fund me or feed me or entertain me or anything like that. There will be a point where I will need to live off the portfolio and then constructs will change. And, and just a quick point, and I'm going to do a whole session on that one day, but just a quick point. When you're living off the portfolio, the key thing you do is you have a, a fair chunk of it, probably at least a third, maybe as much as half of it, in cash or near cash. And the reason for that is quite simple, because you're drawing down money from that portfolio. So when markets are booming, not like they are now, we have to go, we have to go back to 2006 to remember booming markets. Top 40 did 42% in 2006. In 2006 and 2007, when valuations were crazy and markets were booming, you were selling equity to generate cash. But then in 08 or 09, when markets were crashing, you don't want to be selling equity in crashing markets, so you're drawing down on the cash. And that's how you then manage that process. And you've still got that wiggle room because you've got the pile of cash. So you can time your exits are then price-based rather than fundamental-based. But until we get to that point, it really is around the story rather than the price. In an ideal world, and this is a ShopRite uh, uh, monthly chart, you know, we would have sold ShopRite there in late 2013 when it broke 200 bucks for the first time. We bought it in end of 2015 uh, when it was back at 125. Sold it earlier this year at 280 and change, and you know, and, and that's the perfect thing to do. The reality, of course, is that we probably do something like that. We buy it there and then we sell it because it broke 100. And I mark that point at the 100 for two important reasons. One is I was on CNBC Africa with Bronwyn Nielsen the first time ShopRite went through 100. And she said to me, is this share expensive? And I said, it is eye-wateringly crazy expensive. And she said to me, so are you selling? I said, don't be stupid. 
it's expensive. Why, why would I be selling? And there's a curious factoid which I was digging into, which is that uh, our lovely, famous Christo Visa. Christo Visa stories are very different than they used to be in the olden days. Christo Visa actually put a zero-cost collar on ShopRite back here. And what a zero-cost collar effectively does is it says that if a share falls below a certain level, you don't lose money. And if it rises above a certain level, you don't make money. And the level on his zero-cost collar was in the 60-odd bucks. So he was zero-cost collaring here in 2009. And it got so painful, he couldn't close the zero-cost collar because it's time-dated. You can't exit early. He had to take derivative positions to offset the loss he was making on a zero-cost collar. And he was trying to time his own share and basically you know, shot both his feet off. Um, you know, so in the, perfect, in the reality is you, you would probably be selling at the 100 Rand because it's expensive and it spent, uh, what, almost a year floating around that level. And then you would buy terrible and sell terrible. The idea that we will sell at tops and buy at bottoms is perfect in theory, but in practice it never works. I, I met someone in, in Cape Town a few weeks ago who decided that the world was coming to an end. So he went into cash in 2011. He's been in cash ever since. So he's been, and I said to him, well, at what point do you decide the world hasn't ended and you're going to reinvest? Or do you con continue to wait for the world to end? And he, either, I, I don't know, he either almost burst into tears or punched me, but he got this really weird look on his face. And I just sort of stepped back and spoke to somebody else. Um, that level of precision timing, and if any of you have tried your hand at trading, is immensely difficult. And the point with trading is that when you jump out of one trade, if it carries on running, that's fine. You can go find another one. But you know what? And all the retailers in the, in the uh, of all the retailers in the world, ShopRite is the one I want to own. And, and I mean that sincerely. And there, there's solid reasons why ShopRite is, on a global scale, the best re food retailer to own. I mean, it makes the likes of, of those UK and European and North American retailers look positively lazy in terms of profitability and efficiencies, et cetera, et cetera. So what we actually then do in, 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 in the reality world is we sort of just keep on buying it. No red arrows. We just keep on buying, and those happen to be my buys on ShopRite over the last 15 years. Um, I switched out of pick and pay into ShopRite at this point. We can touch on why in a bit. We just, we like the stock. We continue to like the stock. And as price is attractive, we buy it. And then there will be protracted periods of time when, when you aren't buying because price isn't attractive. Um, but as long as it's you know, in your favor, you're happy, you're there, you're going to buy it, and you're going to be quite content with it. And you're just constantly adding to a position. And sometimes you might pause. So quick detour onto Sassel. Sassel was the, wasn't the first share I bought, but it's the share I have held the longest in my portfolio. I bought in 1994. So it's what, 24 years I've held that share. Um, and there was a period about four years ago or so where I became less convinced about Sassel. So I just stopped buying it. I just said, you know what, I don't care about price. I, I'm not selling it, but I want to see, and it was the whole, you know, where's oil going, what's happening with the ethane cracker plant in Lake Charles, et cetera, et cetera. And I just stopped buying Sassel. Remember, it was at 360 forever in a day, and everyone was telling you it was a cheap price, and it, it was both, I agreed at the time and in hindsight, but I just lost my, some of my conviction. And it was a weird space to be in wasn't losing enough conviction to exit it. It was like, there's stuff happening here and I need to see how it pans out. And now that ethane cracker plant is nearly finished, uh, so they'll start getting cash flow because they're not spending uh, CapEx anymore. And then the ethane cracker plant will come into production and they'll start getting revenue from, from it again. So suddenly at around the, you know, I think a 2020 price for, for, for uh, uh, Sassel is probably somewhere around, a fair value is probably around 600 bucks, uh, add some enthusiasm, some more. So again, at the current price, to me, it looks like decent valuation. But I just sort of went, you know, went pause on it. And then a stock, which I have in my death to us part portfolio, which is Billiton. Um, and that was just a bad mistake. And the bad mistake is quite simple. Not that I haven't made money on it, although I'm not sure that I've made enough money to buy dinner. Certainly not dinner and wine. I can have dinner or wine. Um, and I mean in totality. And the reason why Billiton was a terrible mistake is commodity companies are cyclical. And cyclical stocks don't belong. They're not bottom drawer stocks. Cyclical stocks, you want to buy them when the world is ending and sell them when nothing can go wrong. Um, if you put them in a bottom drawer stock, 
in a, in a bottom drawer, you will come back many, many decades later and discover that you have a pile of dust and not very much else. Uh, and and that, that, that's just cyclical stocks, and they have their place, but truthfully, they don't have a place in a death to us part portfolio. So really what we're looking for is that thinking long term. We're not going to get our entries and exits right. We're going to have, we're going to park, we're going to sit, um, we're going to receive dividends while we're waiting. And if you're exiting, if you're constantly panicking and jumping out, if you've got quality shares, you're, you're paid to hold them. And when I receive dividends, I focus on two components of the dividend. I focus on the current dividend yield. So I get a shop right dividend I don't know when it's due, but my next shop right dividend, share price is 230 Rand. What's the dividend on that? But I also say, what's that dividend on my average purchase price? Now, what's my dividend yield on my average price? My average purchase price on shop right, I think, is 82 Rand. So what's my you know, the, the, the dividend yield on that on the average that I've actually paid over it? So you don't get those dividends. And we get held to we, we get hold, we get paid to hold shares. That's a glorious place to be. And the point being is that if you're constantly trying to get in and out and timing it, aside from the fact that you're not going to time it right, you're going to get taxed accordingly. Uh, at best, you're going to get CGT. At worst, you're going to get income tax uh, on your profits. You're going to get spreads and costs. So if we go back to that chart there, that trade there, which goes from 120 to one to 280, which on the surface is 160 bucks profit, which has percentages as giant numbers, after SARS has had their slice, it's half gone. Uh, SARS is like, thank you for working for us. And and uh, tax, you know, tax is real, and 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 we pay it where we can, but where we where we where we don't have to pay it, we don't have to. And and triggering tax events willy nilly is, I mean, imagine in that scenario where I suppose there, if you're losing money, it's less of an issue. But at that point, imagine selling out at a hundred bucks, paying all of your tax, and then watching it go to two hundred bucks. Yeah, you've been shafted twice. Talk about pain and suffering. What's critically important, and this goes back to, and if the person who sent me the email is in the audience this evening, I apologize. I'm not ripping you. Uh, the email I got last week, someone emailed me and said they're looking for a really long-term investment through to 2021. Yeah, so I did the math three times just to be very sure that 2021 was really just three years away. Now, part of me just boggles that. I mean, I'm old enough to remember when, when, when Y2K and 2000 was a big event. And then I met someone the other day who was born after 2000. And that just staggered my brain. Um, she is 16 and she was born in 2002. And that, that, that still hurts the head. Anyway, um, the point being is that you know, long-term investing really is decades. You know, it's, it's not even five years. It's not even really 10 years. It really, really is decades. I remember my, my grandfather taught me about markets. He used to trade the bucket shops in, in West Street in the 1920s and 30s. Um, and, and his view used to be, he used to say, you know, short term to him was about 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, medium term was about 10 or 20 years. And long term was until he died. Uh, and he died at the age of 94. Uh, but you know, to him, medium term was, was, was measured in decades. And now we sort of got to this place now where, where short term is like, I don't know, a couple of years and long term is three to five years and medium term somewhere kind of in the middle. Um, no, long term really still needs to be measured in the decades. And I know we're all in a hurry, but, but it really needs to be decades. Um, and that's why my portfolio is until death do us part, as I said, until I die or until they die. <clears throat> the key point with selling long-term investments is that we're not going to exit at the top. You know, you're not going to discover Steinhoff as a house of fraud and sell Steinhoff at 90 Rand. In truth, you're going to discover that Steinhoff is a fraud at 17 Rand. Um, and that's a, a really, really bad example. But the truth, you know, that's how it works. And, and, and you know, when I sold my, my, my net banks, I got a, I pretty much got a top of a market. But when I sold my pick and pays, I sold them 30% off the all-time highs. And that was quite a deep, painful experience, except you know, it ultimately turned out to be very much the right thing to do. So we don't avoid it. We don't get it perfectly. We don't get out at the top. But what we do do in a perfect world is avoid nasty shocks. Excuse me. And part of that nasty shock is 20 years of underperformance. 
you know, a stock that just doesn't do well for decades and decades and decades. And there are there are plenty of them, you know, not just locally, but even globally. I mean, yeah, you know, back in the day when I was learning about stock markets, there were three shares that I was told these are the and we're talking U.S. shares. These are the three shares that you have to own. And they were respectively General Motors went bankrupt, uh, General Electric going bankrupt, and Disney. And Disney's probably the one of and, – and Disney, truthfully, for about 15 years, you probably wish you'd never heard of Minnie or Mickey or Pluto or any of the other characters involved in it either. Locally, there were two shares that every portfolio had in it, and that was Anglo-American and SAB Miller. And you were right on the SAB Miller. You were wrong on the Anglo-American. The Anglo-American 30-year return is below the market return. If you time Anglo right and you bought it at 100 odd rand when they cancelled their dividend in 08, 09, you've done spectacularly. But if you bought it to the highs of 06, 07, well, you're still underwater 12, 13 years later. So the point is, know your stock. Know why you buy it. So what I do, I... I I'm, a, I, I'm an obsessive note taker in, in, in my stocks and I, and I keep my journals. I've got all of my journals for, for, for my investing. It's about 25 journals. They, they, they're the moleskin, so they're skinny, but there's about 25 of them. Um, and, and in my trading world, I make as detailed journals, but I don't keep them simply because by now I'd have hundreds and hundreds. Um, but my stock journals, I keep every single one. So I've got the notes that I made in the 90s around different shares. And what I do is I decide I want to investigate a share. Should I? Or should I not be buying it? And I start going doing my digging and I'm making notes while I'm doing that process. And at the end of the process, I turn to a new page and I write two lists on it. And one is the three things I like about it. And one is the three risks that exist in this business. The risks are very important for two reasons. Firstly, there has to be some risk. If there's no risk, you're missing it. I mean, there has to be some risk. Every, every stock, every share, every, every everything has some risk. Know the risk. I, I went surfing this morning, and it was weird because all the beaches were closed. And I'm like, why are the beaches closed? Oh, that's fine. Got my surfboard paddle out. So to the surfer oak next to me, why is the beaches closed? He's like sardine run. Shark nets have been lifted. Ho, ho, ho. Noted. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I should have asked that question before I went into the water. Um, anyway, I decided I was a faster swimmer than any of them which truthfully was a lie, but like, you know, I'm from Joburg. We don't have good waves in Johannesburg. So you've got to know what are the good parts and what are the bad parts to that stock. And then I write them down. And, and what I do now, because, you know, modernity and all, is I digitize those notebooks. I, I, I scan them and make PDFs. So I've got the PDF document of it, and then I've got the original. And they're all there. They're all available. I, I went back and looked at my notes on why I sold SAB Miller in 1998. And my logic was right. <laughs> It just turned out that I was wrong. And I'll give you a quick, so why did I sell SAB Miller? Well, the reason I sold it was why did I buy it? And the reason I bought it was I was hiking down in the Trans Sky in 1993. Me and my buddies had been hiking for four days. We hadn't seen a human being in four days. We crest a hill, and there's a chap in a hut, and he's selling me Black Label. And I'm like, yo, I, I don't like Black Label. It's warm, but like. So we didn't have money, so we traded sugar for Black Label because for some reason we had gone hiking with two kgs of sugar. Um, yeah, anyway. But what occurred to me there was the strength of SAB Miller was not its beer. It was its distribution. You've never walked into a liquor retailer or bar or restaurant or, and said, I'll have a castle, and they have said, sorry, no stock. Never. That will not happen. SAB's strength was their distribution. And then they veered and they decided to go offshore and start buying these offshore brands. And I'm like, hang on a second. Your distribution is South Africa. You own the trucks. You know where the shabines and the bottle stores and the hotels and the restaurants are. And you suddenly go to some strange country. What do you know? So I was worried that one of the key reasons I bought SAB was being broken. Their, their distribution network. So I exited so my logic was all sound. It just turned out that, truthfully, SAB management was way smarter than I gave them credit for and that they can do distribution. And, I mean, frankly, the reason they don't distribute to the moon is because there ain't no one on the moon to buy their beer. Um, if there was, they would do it. So you need those for and you need those against. There's an important point, two important points. I'll come to big picture in a moment. There's an important point which says the reasons why, the positive reasons for a stock, I'm reluctant to change. The risks to a stock, 
I'm happier to change. And here's why. I buy a share because there's things about it that I think are groundbreaking and make it best of class. If I'm changing those, well, hang on, groundbreaking and best of class is not something that changes once a year, every three or four years. Groundbreaking, groundbreaking and best of class is something that should be baked into the company's DNA and should be there ideally forever. Yet risks are more dynamic. Risks might be new competitors, new technology and the like. So I'm happy to change the risks, that side of the equation. I'm less happy to change the, the reasons why I bought. But also the important point is to get that big picture and the portfolio construction. And what I mean by big picture, and this again helps inform, I'll come back to that in a second. Now, where's my slide I'm looking for? There's my big picture. I'll come back to that one in a moment is how you put that portfolio together. And, and, and you know, the, in, any portfolio needs a key driver to it. You know, your driver might be that the future is AI and technology and therefore you own the FANGs and Microsoft, etc. My key driver, and has been for 20 odd years, um, and this was in part informed by Adrian Savoy, Durban boy who now runs Canyon and others up in Johannesburg, was growing middle class, growing consumer, more people moving into the cities, more people moving into the middle class. Uh, truthfully, in South Africa, happening, but happening slowly. In places like China, 800 million people in the last 20 years have gone from living a rural poverty life to living in a city. Now, make no bones, when they move to the city, they're not all la da and buying iPhones and Galaxy 9s and the like. No, but they're in a city. They're, 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 they're earning a little bit more. They're spending a little bit more. Their kids are going to have a better life. Their grandkids a better, better life. And in fact, in China, that acceleration between the generations is, a, is, is immensely fast compared to if you look at the, the, the living standards of, of, of three generations, child, parent, grandparent, um, it's immensely fast. But that's partly because China, China's China. You know, no democracy, they do as they like. You know, they want to build a dam, you're in the way, you've got two choices, both of them involve moving. Um, so to me, it was always going to be around consumer staples and consumer discretionary. And those are always the sort of stocks I've, I've, I've geared towards. And if you look at my portfolio, that's where they fit in. No cyclicals, no resources, no construction. And when I go back to my portfolio in a second, you'll see where I've erred in that point there. But I very much want those consumer staples, consumer discretions. It's why I like food stocks, not the manufacturing part, because manufacturing of food is cyclical because rain comes and wheat prices vary or rains leave and those sort of things or locusts or something like that. But selling food, because you know what we're going to do for the rest of our life? Eat. And what are we going to do for the rest of our life is, you know, watch entertainment. I was going to say TV, but truthfully, I'm showing my age. We're going to be entertained one way or another. We're going to have bank accounts. I mean, anyone here love their bank? No. Anyone here feel their bank isn't ripping them off? No. Anyone here not have a bank account? No, because you have bank accounts. Because, do you know what? <laughs> you know, if you're on a bank account, it's really, really simple. Go live in the, in the Namba Desert and, 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 you know, hunt your own stuff. So, that, and I've spoken about this lots. Core of ETFs, my till death, my second tier, my trading. The second tier is where my commodity stocks should be. Uh, and, 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 and bulletins just truthfully should be sitting in the second tier. I'm waiting for bulletin to move enough and then I'll take my little bit of profit from it and, and head for the hills. Just quick side story in bulletin. Uh, last time I bought bulletin was 2007. Um, I was still living in Durban. It was January 2007. I was sitting at the coffee shop at the pavilion. I forget what it's called. It uh, doesn't matter. Sitting at the coffee shop and I spent literally the entire day buying those bulletin shares. And at the end of the day, I had an average price that was like two cents below the low of the day. And I was a genius. I'd say I'd made so much money by getting such a great price. And the next day, bulletin opened one and a half percent lower. And I'd wasted a day in my life. If you like the price, buy it. What I would typically do, if I like a price on the shares, I stagger my buys. So if I think that Richmond's a great buy at, 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 at 92.50, I'll put a buy at 92.50, I'll put a buy at 90, 87.50, 85, 82. And then Richmond falls to 86 and I pick up some of them, but not all of them. I did the same with Woolies. I had buys on Woolies from 78 down to 64 and I picked up all of them and now Woolies is 54. This is not an exact science. 
If it wasn't exact science, we would all be rich by now. It might, which is terrible because then I can't even buy a packet of chuckles with my Woolies share. So, keep those notes. There's an important point around notes is to handwrite them. And, and this is off topic, but it's how our brains work. The point with, with typing and digital, etc., is aside from the distractions, your emails popping up, etc., etc., is your brain works properly and better when you are physically writing. And they've done this research with students in America. They give them iPads, they give them laptops, they give them pen and paper, and the kids with pen and paper simply do better. They recall more, they think better, they get higher marks. It's how our brains work. So I'm a big fan of good old-fashioned pen and paper. So we keep make them handwritten, but then we can store them digitally. And because we store them digitally, we keep them forever. The keeping forever is critically important. You want to be able to go back, and I'll show you in a moment why. You want to be able to go back and refer to what you did, why you did it. You also want to go back sometimes and work out what you did right, i.e., you bought this share. What, what, what was your astounding fate of logic that made you buy it? But you also want to go back sometimes and what did you do wrong? And remember, there are two ways you did wrong here. One is that you bought a share that was a bad buy. One is that you didn't buy a share that was a good buy. And I do that a lot. So why don't, why don't I own clicks? So there are three reasons I don't own clicks. Because I had a look at clicks in about 2004. My concerns were legislation, single exit pricing on the pharmacies, etc. All of that was coming. It was still a number of years away, but I wasn't convinced by this whole selling drugs in, in, in click stores, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I thought that there was no, no real profit there, no real margin in that business. I, I was completely wrong on that. Um, the other point, which I was even more massively wrong on, is they'd bought Musica. And I'm like, yo, come on, man, even I know that's wrong. I mean, I had an iPod. Um, it, it was really you know, my first iPod. It was a one gig iPod, man. That thing was rocked my world. Um, I had my one gig iPod, I had my iTunes, and I was downloading music illegally because there was no legal way to download it. Um, and I looked at the music and it wasn't that I thought music was bad, I thought that they'd made a bad acquisition. And I thought to myself, this bothers me about management, that they're going to go and buy more bad acquisitions. And it turned out that was a one-off. But I'm able to go back and say to myself, why don't I own clicks? What was the mistakes I made? Um, and, and, and in a sense, try and make myself smarter for it. Those were my Steinhoff notes. <laughs> so sometimes you get it spectacularly right. The two things that worry me about Steinhoff, and I know you can't read my handwriting. That's not the intent here. Uh, two things that worried me about Steinhoff was the balance sheet. I'm not a rocket scientist, but that balance sheet was complicated and confused. And when I get confused around a balance sheet, I try to work out the debt, and I couldn't work out their debt. They gave me a, a net debt number, and I couldn't, I couldn't get my calculations to agree with their calculations. Um, and I'm just like, you know what? And there were other issues that I had. I also thought Conforama was perhaps a bit of a dodge deal. So this, was, this note was, oh, where's my date? I think it was 2012. And I went through it, and it's like, nope, not for me. And for a long time, I was very wrong. I mean, at this point, the stock's 25 Rand. It goes to 90. And every so, every so often, I'd go back and I'd revisit and I'd see, well, has the balance sheet got less complicated? No. Can I work out the debt? Still can't. Well, then I stay away. I'm happy to not be in some shares. You know, that, that, and Steinhoff I'm using in part because it's now a buck and change. I mean, it's, it's you know, uh, and it's going to 30 cents sometime soon. And, and uh, the VBE, so they're being sued by VBE. VBE are a Dutch, a Dutch group of people who sue companies who do bad things. Um, they have a success record, which is 100%, with the exception being Sometimes the companies they're suing go bust before they can finish suing them. So VBE were in Joburg last week, and their view on Steinhoff is quite simple. Steinhoff will go bust before they finish suing them. That is, that is their official view. Steinhoff is bankrupt. Um, so, you know, that, that, and you look like a fool for ages, but stick to your guns. So... Let's look at some stocks and let's look at some examples of what I did or didn't like. Uh, ShopRite, first purchase on ShopRite 2003. Um, what I liked for it was operating margins, 5.6. When I say they're the best retailer in the world, of any food retailer with more than 1,000 shares, sorry, 1,000 stores, ShopRite has the best operating margin on planet Earth. The average for a food retailer with more than a thousand stores, operating margin is 1.8%. Pick up 
pick and pay is 2%, ShopRite is 5.6. Simon, what is Walmart's low and interest? It is one and some change, okay. maybe one and a half. It's one and change. Um, now, now, ShopRite is partly helped by the rest of the continent, where they get better margins because there's less price competition. And that will, in time, change. But that's not going to change in a hurry. You know, Nigeria and, and the, other, the other territories there and are not going to suddenly have hundreds of stores and get that massive competition. That margin will shrink in time. But interestingly, pick and pay, when Richard Brasher arrived four years ago to save pick and pay, operating margin, 2%. Current operating margin, 2%. Short answer, he's done nothing in four years. Now, he, they will argue different. And, and I, I hear the story with pick and pay, um, and I do expect that margin to start increasing. But he has an interesting factoid. What do the banks charge for a credit card transaction at, at pick and pay? 1.3%. The banks are making almost more money from pick and pay than pick and pay is making from pick and pay. And the banks don't have to do any work. They just put credit card facilities in all the various different stores uh, or take the cash. So my, it was operating margins I liked. What I liked with ShopRite was Africa. They already had their Africa. They went into the rest of the continent in the early 90s. Remember, Pick and Pay went to Australia and bought Franklin's. And at this point, 2003, Pick and Pay is struggling under Franklin's. I exited Pick and Pay because margins were coming under pressure. They were losing market share and Franklin's was killing them. Ended up costing them about, about a billion rand. And back in those days, a billion rand was proper money. And now a billion rand is a good weekend. Um, and their distribution centers. Already by now, uh, uh, ShopRite are starting with their early distribution centers. And you can already, when speaking to management and the like, you can see the impact of those distribution centers coming through. There's a weird thing that happens in this country, which we're just so used to. And truthfully, if you shop at Pick and Pay, I was in a pick and pay 10 days ago for no good reason. I, 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 don't, I don't own the share, so I don't go there. I shop at Woolies. I shop at ShopRite, right? Because that's what I own. Keep it in the house. Keep it in the family. Anyway, there's a weird thing that happens when you're at, a, at a, any, any ShopRite store, to a lesser degree Woolies and, and pick and pay, is that the shelves are always full. You never have to reach to the back of a shelf to get a product. The, the, the product's right to the front. You go to the US, you go to uh, uh, the UK, you go to Europe. It's like shopping in Mozambique. The shelves are half empty. And ShopRite's view is quite simple. The product you want, sir, is right at your line. You can see it. You can reach it nice and easy. You sell it every single time. When I was at Pick and Pay the other day, I was looking for black pepper. Uh, particularly, I wanted corns. And I almost missed it because I saw the black pepper. I saw the white pepper. I saw the gap. And it's like they haven't got black pepper corns. Fortunately, I'm tall up here. Ah, oh, they do. I've got long arms. I can reach it. They almost lost the sale. Now you're thinking to yourself, yeah, black peppercorns, one sale, life moves on. The point is ShopRite never lose that sale because their shelves are packed every single time. And it's weird. For us as South Africans, that's just what food retailer shelves look like. And then you go somewhere else, and it's like, yo, hang on, what's this? I'm in London, and there's, the shelves are half empty. It's like, ah, it's coming, it's coming. Um, my concerns were foreign competition, that someone would come in and take over, the, try and take over. And truthfully, I thought it might be one of the UK retailers. It ended up being uh, that Walmart arrived and bought MassMart. Man, and MassMart is, uh, Walmart is wishing they'd never heard of MassMart. They paid 150 bucks a share in 2011. Well, actually, early 2012, I think it was. They paid 100 million rand into some special fund uh, and a whole bunch of other things, and their investment has gone exactly nowhere. And if you remember when that first happened, they had some flyers in the weekend press about the, War the Mass Smart Walmart specials, and they had uh, uh, those bra things on special and this and that, and, uh, and what's happened now? Nothing. Uh, the biggest date ever. And at that time, Walmart was saying that this was their beachhead into Africa. Well, Africa won. Walmart got knocked out. So when Walmart came, I'm like nervous. I'm like, okay, hang on a second. And remember, they via game, they launched their food arm. What's that called? Food Corp. And they started coming at that place and they started selling food. It's just not working. Who goes to game to buy? Oh, firstly, you folks live in Durban. Game is part of our DNA. Um, in Joburg, no one's heard of game. I mean, they exist, but it's not, 
you know, I think the first game was on West Street, uh, way back in the day. Whereas in Joburg, the first game arrived, Smith sorry, Smith Street. Um, you know, we know about game, but also why do we know about game? Because it's the best place to buy a bed or a stereo. Lettuce? Not so much. So that did bother me. I was worried about FX. There's a risk here with FX that, and I'll tell you what the risk is, and I'll tell you how they've mitigated it. <clears throat> My concern was that a African economy would, well, would do what Zimbabwe did, <clears throat> and their currency would get completely obliterated. So you make a great profit, and you send it home, and, well, you can have dinner or wine, not both. Um, and yes, Zimbabwe did get obliterated. They don't have a major presence there. The key way that they've managed it is by having exposure across multiple countries, 14 if memory serves correct, with no country, obviously, <coughs> excuse me, not South Africa, I'm talking the rest of the continent, no country being massive. So if Nigeria, for example, did a Zimbabwe and the Naira went you know, to hell and back in a handbasket, it would hurt, but it wouldn't be an end of, end of world scenario. So that was a concern, but mitigated. And then I was worried that if the foreign competition didn't work, that there might be an attempt to do a takeover or a merger and shake me out of the position. And that nearly happened. Steinhoff tried to buy my ShopRite shares. That was the closest shave I've had in a long, long time. I remember me and the PRC, we said no chance. Well, mostly the PRC, but <clears throat> I was standing right behind them. The distribution centers, still knockout, still world class. When, when, go, go to the ShopRite website, go to the investor relations, go find the, the, the presentation that they do every time they do results. And they talk about their stats from their distribution centers. Those stats are astounding in terms of how quickly they turn stuff around. Most stuff is in that distribution center for like 36 hours. And then it's in a store, and then it's sold, and they got more coming. So it's real. It works. The rest of Africa continues to work. They've been slow and steady. They've been in Africa for over 20 years in the rest of the continent. They've been slowly, steadily growing it. But, you know, how many others have tried and failed? Woolies went to Nigeria and did their winter range. And Nigeria is like, man, we don't do winter here. This is called the equator. <laughs> Telcom went there and bought Multilinks. And there was like, no, man, we don't do Multilinks. We've got MTN. What do we want a telephone for? We've got a mobile phone. And so the list goes on of companies. Uh, yeah, there are two places South African companies go to buy, to die. One is the rest of Africa and the other is Australia. Unless, of course, you're famous brands and go and get indigestion in the UK. And those operating margins remain solid. I do expect them to come down at point as, as the rest of the continent becomes more competitive. But when I say I expect that to happen, I don't expect it to happen this year or even in 2020. Or, you know, maybe by 2030, that operating margin will be at 4.2. Still going to be world class, and it's going to be on a much, much bigger revenue. So what I'm looking for, as long as those remain in place, I'm comfortable. And as long as none of those come and significantly bite me in my nose, I'm comfortable. And the share price hits 200 and falls to 125. I don't care. Hits 280 and is now down to 220. I'm not stressed. I've got my buy levels. I was buying at 245 on the way up, and I was buying at 235 on the way down. And a whole bunch before that at the same time. I know clearly why I own it. What you will note is missing from that list is return on equity and, and, and DCF and, and Gordon discount models and all of those type of things for a couple of important points. Firstly, those sort of ratios, particularly things such as return on equity and the like, can be highly volatile. Whereas an operating margin is, 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 you know, it might move by 10 points here, 10 points there, but it's not massively volatile. A discounted cash flow or a Gordon discount model requires massive assumptions on my behalf. And they are more price slash valuation significant as distinct from quality. What I'm looking for here when I'm doing this process when I'm sitting down back in 2003, living up in Burtis Hill at the time, or both the hill, as we used to say before I moved to Joburg. You say both the hill, and everyone looks at you squiff. It's like I'm from Durban, guys. I say girl, I say hill, I say both is. Um, 
when I was sitting down and, 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 and running this at the point, those were the things that said to me. And yes, I could have done a DCF, but a DCF tells me valuation. I'm not looking at valuation. I'm looking at quality. Why do I want to own this one and not that one or that one or that one? Why this stock? Because I purposely went out. I said to myself, I need to own a food retailer. And there were options. There weren't, there weren't many options, truthfully, in our market. Back then, SPA wasn't yet listed. They hadn't yet been spun out. Um, MassMart hadn't yet decided to do their, 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 their foray into food. So your options were pretty much ShopRite and uh, uh, pick and pay. And you can take the lazy way out and say, I'll buy both. I got a simple rule. I'll never own more than two shares in a sector. Like banks, either you either own zero, one, or two. If you're buying three, you can't make up your mind, just then go buy all of them. And if there are only two shares in the sector, then I'm only allowed to own one of them. Because then you're just saying, well, I can't choose. And, and part of investing is about that choosing. Biggest threat to ShopRite right now? probably still the takeover attempt, but it's probably going to be, if anyone, a foreigner, and at this point, probably not going to happen. Pick and pay is certainly a threat in the sense that pick and pay has been mismanaged now for, I take that back, pick and pay has had a tough 20 years. They were The, the Ackermans took their eye off the ball uh, back in the late 90s, uh, didn't invest back into the company, didn't spend money on distribution centers, margins went sly, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and they've paid the price for it. And, 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 you know, and, and Richard Brasher is probably the biggest threat. But can Richard Brasher get pick and pay to be a superior business to ShopRite? Yes. Can you do it in the next five or ten years? No. Will I one day sell my ShopRites and go back to pick and pay? Sure. If, 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 the, if the argument is persuasive. But pick and pay must come and prove it. They must get their operating margins up to north of five. They must get a strategy for the rest of the continent that is solid and working and viable and proving itself. And, and you know, the key point again back in 2003 is that they, you know, ShopRite was already earning at that point about 10% of its revenue into the rest of the continent. They had presence in, at that point already in nine countries. It wasn't a plan. It was a reality which they could build on. Choppies. They got no chance. The key point of being a mass food retailer is the mass part. And you need to have the size and the scale because that gives you two things. It means your distribution centers work and it gives you buying power. It gives you a third thing, which is national advertising buy. You can advertise in the Sunday Times. Uh, Choppies is a little bit in KZN, Zimbabwe. They're on the Platinum Corridor, which is a deeply unfortunate place to be. That's not their fault. But it means that they got a niche by their advertising. It means that if they've got toilet paper in Rustenburg and they need it in Durban, it's like it's just in the wrong place. Um, the Choppies has got no chance, is my short answer. Advertech, first entry last year. Uh, the four is state education is a mess. Um, what we also know is that parents will give up amazing things to educate their child, of course. I mean, this is, I mean, this is just a no-brainer. What parent has children and says, you know what, <laughs> I think I'm going to throw the kids under the bus and send them to a crap school. Uh, no. You send them to the best school that you can afford, and in many cases, you send them to the best school that you can't afford and you make a plan. You cut DSTV or, or your insurance policies or stuff like that. Um, and when I say state education is a mess, we spend 14 times more money per child educated than Mozambique, yet we are number 142 on the list and Mozambique is about number 32. It's not that we haven't got the money, it's just that it's not being effectively used. There are reasons for that. They are not relevant to the process. Um, well, they are, perhaps. The reasons are largely, uh, uh, let's not go down that road. They've got the brands. They've got strong brands. Education is a brand. If I open Simon's Super School tomorrow, everyone's going to be like, yo, dude, Simon's Super School, nice name, but... Who are you? It's hard to establish that. Now, truthfully, it's becoming easier. There's been a couple of examples up in Gauteng, and I happen to know the people who were involved, who've started schools and got some fairly good traction fairly quickly. That's been thanks to Kira and Stadio, who's put a spotlight not just in the investing world, but in the, in the world of parents and, and teachers 
that suddenly, hang on, this is a different game. But brand is important. Crawford College, the fact that, you know, I, I never went, I went to Pantown Boys High for my sins. Um, Crawford College is a, you know, even when I was a kid, it's a brand. People know it. Uh, they, they understand what it is. It's got significant value. With respect to Kira, Kira doesn't have that brand yet. Can it get there? Of course. Um, and then they've got locations. And the key thing with the school is location. You don't want to have to drive your kid 40 minutes to school. You will if you have to. But what you really want is a nice, well-located school. And you'll see a lot of what Kira has done with their green fields operations is they've bought in, so in, in Joburg a lot out in the West Rand. Because the West Rand is where all the development is happening. So basically you drop a school and then you hope that the development sort of surrounds you in time and you can get your occupancy levels higher. And that model works. The distinction with, with, with Advertech is they've got those schools. The other thing that Cura did was went and go buy schools. But then soon enough, you just run out of schools to buy. Yeah, it, it, there's a finite number of them. So those are the key bits I like about it. The one thing I don't like about it is the business they've got, which is their recruitment business. But I've been telling management it's a silly idea for longer than I can remember, and they are ignoring me. The biggest against for this is probably online. Khan Academy. Uh, Corsa. Yeah, I mean, I decided I'm going to, I, I, I got some programming knowledge. I can do a couple of, of programming languages like Java and others, but I decided I want to go and learn a new programming language of some sort. So I haven't decided what language yet I've got to go and spend my, but I know that once I've decided the, on the language I'm going to learn, I'm then going to go to Corsa or one of these online places and I'm going to learn it for free. Oh, why pay? That, that, just seems silly to pay these days. Is, yeah, is, that a, is that a real threat? Yes. Is it a threat today? Yeah, two degrees. Yeah, if I am looking for a job and I've got a, a, a degree in, 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 in uh, 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 Java programming from MIT versus I did a Khan Academy, the MIT still wins. The UKZN still wins. The Durban University of Technology still wins. The, the Boston College still wins. But that's because we're all old timers and we know these brands. The new kids coming through, when they're us and making those decisions, they're going to be like Khan Academy. Yeah, man, that thing rocks. They're going to understand who Khan is. They're going to have watched his videos and they're going to understand that it's, that it's real and that it actually works. Real threat. Kira Stadio, yeah. At the point, remember that uh, Kira tried to buy Advertech a few years ago? That kind of shook them up. Um, one of the big concerns, particularly with Kira and Stadio, was just simply that they, were, that they would rush out and buy schools and Advertech would try and compete and that would push prices up and they would make unrealistic purchases. That hasn't happened so much. Certainly, if we look at our education space around... Uh, three and a half to four percent of South African children are in private education. That number globally is closer to 12 percent. We have got structural differences in our country, which means we're unlikely to get to 12 percent, but certainly six, seven, maybe eight percent is very, very possible in the education space, which means a lot more growth. So, how do you think people will grow because of the low GDP numbers? Yeah, look, I mean, low GDP, and there's some, some, some issues around it, particularly I mean, just to a large degree agriculture. Truthfully, the low GDP is, is this year and next year's problem. Um, this is you know, in five or ten years. Look, if we're still in low GDP in five or ten years' time, we have way problems. I'm of the assumption that at some point, President Ramaphosa gets the ship turned around. These are not easy things to do, and we can start growing again. And truthfully, Two, three percent isn't terribly exciting. We need closer to four or five. And we've done that before. That's what we were doing back in 06, 07. Two things happened to us back then. One was a global financial crisis and one was a local presidential crisis. My other concern is occupancy. And there's two issues around occupancy. So schools are quite simple. You've got a base cost, right? And the more students you get, ultimately they just go straight to the bottom line because whether your class is 16 kids or 18 kids, no real difference. Those two extra kids are just all about profit. Problem with Advertech is that they're pretty much at that capacity point. They, you know, their occupancy levels are in the 80s, and so you know, whereas Kuro's are closer to in the 50s. Kuro's got more spec there. The trick with Kuro is you're paying top dollar for it. Kuro will, at 90% occupancy, earn two rand a share at a current price of 30 rand. That puts them on a forward PE of 15, but that forward PE is five years out. 
that's a long time. And then your share is, in other words, the share is going nowhere for five years on a simple mathematics. The other flip from occupancy is perhaps declining occupancy. Why would occupancy decline? Well, last year it did. Why? Immigrations, people not being able to afford, people relocating, relocating for work, relocating for cost, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But again, that's a short-term blip. If, 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 if former President Zuma was president for life, real problem. But he's not just president of KwaZulu Natal or something like that. It's complicated, hey? Politics is complicated. <clears throat> Capitec. So Capitec is my best purchase ever. And I'm going to be honest, this was the one where I closed my eyes when I purchased it because I was probably least convinced. Um, my handwritten notes uh, say something along the lines of, um, I think I'm right, but, and I've underlined the think and the but, and then underneath I've said, just buy it. And I did. I just bought it. The things I liked about it was pricing in terms of cheapness. Now, I know banks will tell you that they've all got cheap bank accounts. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. The truth is that in terms of Mindshare, Capitec is there. They've also now got 10 million clients or 9.9 million in the last results. By now, it's 10 million. Um, so the potential customer growth has happened, but now there's more potential customer growth, and that comes through products. In other words, those 10 million customers can grow further and they can now sell. When I, back in even, we, we naively forget that in 2009, we had an unbanked problem in this country, and suddenly we don't. There are 10 million people who didn't have a Capitec bank account just 10 years ago, and now they have Capitec bank accounts. Remember the banks, the big banks did their, their, their discount bank plans in the early 2000s, and I forget what it was called, and there have been big disasters, there have been titanic sinkings, and then there have been the bank's attempts to do cheap banking. It's just not in their DNA. It's not in their core structure. Capitec, cost to income, 35%. Big banks, 55 Why? Because Capitec is like only 20 years old, so they didn't start with ledgers and paper. They went straight to computers. The banks are so proud of their 150-year legacy. That's nice, but it means somewhere in their basement is a document that's 150 years old that they've got to go reference every so often. The banks don't have single view of customer. You want to speak to vehicle finance, you phone that person. You want to speak to home loan, you phone that person. Why? Well, because they've got 150 years of paperwork. Capitec's got none of it. Big threat to Capitec, bad debts, and maybe that plays to vice for New entrants, sy systematic, sy systematic risk. So that is, that is bank collapses, and that leads to run on banks. Remember, Capitec listed the day after Sumbo went bust. Sumbo went bust Monday. Capitec listed Tuesday. Two rand, went to 70 cents. It was one of the worst listings of the year, unless you'd bought it and held it all the way through to 2018. Um, new entrants, and the new entrants are coming. So discovery is coming. They don't want Capitec customers. They want the rich people. Uh, Michael Jordan is bringing Bank Zero, but he's probably going for SMEs rather than, than, than private. And there's talk that Capitec will maybe buy Mercantile Bank to get the SME space. Um, Time Bank is coming. Time with uh, Australian Co Commonwealth Bank and a type of pick and pay. Uh, sure. But here's the thing. Time's got zero customers. Capitec's got 10 million. Right now, in that fight, whose side do you want to be on? Capitex. In 10 years, will time have 10 million and Capitec 10 million? Maybe. The point is, I'm not going to knee-jerk panic now. I'm going to say, okay, time is coming. I see you. I'm going to watch you. We're going to see how this happens. All the telcos are trying to do money transfer. M-Pesa is like the biggest money transfer on the continent, but it hasn't spread beyond Kenya. Uh, a little bit. It's East Africa. All of our telcos have tried it with all of our banks, and all of it has failed. Will it work one day? Maybe. In the meantime, I'm watching. The hangover from Viceroy Oak. Yes. So, what Viceroy does is they come out, and understand that they are American, so they come out guns blazing. Hey? Like, I mean, they are, this is how you do it in America. When Ackerman did his short on Herbalife, he firstly launched it with a 220-slide PowerPoint uh, presentation and then a 20-minute video on YouTube. And when I say 20-minute video, Hollywood-style video, I mean slick, and they go guns blazing. Now, what Viceroy came in particular for Capitec was, dot, was stuff that we knew. And this, had, I mean, Financial Mail had written about this back in 2015, 2016. Hannah Zaidi had written about it on uh, MoneyWeb. She was then not married, so she would have been Harry, uh, Hannah, Hannah Barry. Uh, was it Barry or Barry? I forget which. Uh, 
And if I get it wrong, she hates me. This was not new stuff. A lot of, to a lot of people, it was new, but the data had been there, etc. And the, the Capitec is quite simple. There is a difference of opinion. And some people, such as me, say, I see this risk, I understand it, I'm comfortable with it. Others, like Viceroy, say, no, it's end of world and bankruptcy, etc. That's a, that's a difference in opinion. That's what markets are about. Steinhoff is not a difference of opinion. That's fraud. Well, that's not an opinion. That's just illegal, and we know that it is. And Viceroy isn't a one-hit wonder. They've had There's a medical company in America that's just gone bust. They've been short them for over a year. There's an Australian property company, same story. But in terms of Viceroy and Capitec, the war is over. That said, expect Viceroy to carry on coming back. They never wave a white flag. They'll never issue a report and say, okay, we're wrong on Capitec. No, that's not how the shorters work. They'll, they'll keep on trying, and then eventually they go quiet, and they you know, go off quietly into the good night. But this is the question So there were 18, 18 uh, bids for mercantile, and they're not, they're, they're, what's the word, they're, they're expressions of interest. So there are 18, and that's a lot. Which, so the risk is, there are, there are many risks to mercantile, and all of them bother me. Overpaying, because there's a bidding war. Integration. You know, now you've got another system. One of the things with Capitec is one system. Well, now you've got two systems, and you've got to make them one system. If any of you have ever tried that in an IT project, it seldom works. In fact, I'll take that back. It never works the first 13 times you try it. Um, so <coughs> eye off the ball. What they do, their knitting is great, and they've done some clever things. They want to do home loans. So what do they do? Well, they get SA Home Loan to do the home loans, and they just take a turn on that. Because they're saying, you know, home loans aren't our speciality. Our balance sheet can't do it. We're not a, et cetera, et cetera. So there is definitely risk on mercantile. And we'll see how it goes. We'll see who wins. I mean, it might be moot, what price they pay. And then it's a case of how does it play out. I can tell you who my fear is that it was Discovery because I own Discovery and because Discovery makes complexity look like simple stuff. Um, and in fact, when, when, they were, when they announced in January that they were coming with a new stock, I thought it might be Discovery. Um, but I, I don't know who it is. And it might just be them cooking, you know, just, just talking a good talk. That, that's not impossible, but... Uh, City Lodge, I'm going to touch on this quickly. Uh, it was growth, there's different price bands. You can do a road lodge. Uh, back in the day when I was doing this in 2009, I could get a hotel room for 160 Rand. And when I say hotel room, I'm lying to you. It was a little square thing with like a, a basin, which was also a toilet and a shower. Um, and they, they, they nailed the TV to the ceiling because there wasn't space. I mean, it, was, it wasn't a pleasant experience. But, but, you know, back then, if you wanted a hotel in a city, you could do it really, really cheap. Um, they own their land. And that, there have been times, and, and I, I'm, on, I'm out of time, so I can't run into it. But if you look at how they value their land, you go to the annual report and how they value their land. They are deeply conservative. And you can buy that share sometimes at pretty much the value for the land that they have. Not the buildings, just the land, the naked land that they have. That that one they've got here in Durban down at the end down by, I mean, that is that is some nice pretty land. Even the one next to the, the McDonald's is a, not a bad location. And and they are, that's critically important. Um, the risk is oversupply. The World Cup certainly created that. New competition in terms of I was worried about global brands. And in truth, it might be Airbnb. They might also have bad locations that they've managed to avoid. What I mean by that is, for example, you put a giant hotel down at the airport and then the airport moves to La Merci and suddenly your hotel, they've managed to avoid that. The Airbnb might be a real deal. We watch it carefully. I travel a lot for business. I do about 30, 35 nights a year out of home for business. Um, and I use the hotels because I'm a creature of habit. I have an expectation that I know that that hotel will meet and the Airbnb often exceeds it, but sometimes you spend an hour and a half trying to find the keys and I ain't got an hour and a half when I'm traveling for work. When I'm traveling for holidays, sure, different stories, etc. but Airbnb is one worth watching. Truthfully, the bigger issue with Airbnb is there needs to be regulation around it. That's the big issue right now. Um, and at the moment, it isn't just happening. And that regulation when that comes, will then really tell us where this is going to fit going forward. The point is slow to panic. So mass march arrives. 
sorry, Walmart. I don't rush out and sell my, my shop rights. I'm like, okay, so Walmart's here, and then they've got these adverts in the newspaper, and truthfully, I'm getting a little bit nervous. Let's see how this plays out. Which means when I do sell the shares, I'm not at the top. I'm selling somewhere down the, you know, 10, 15, 20, 30% off those highs. But if it's played well, and excuse my shop right example, you know, I've got an average price of 80 odd. If, I, if, if it all goes pear shaped now, I'm selling at 220. Not the worst thing in the world. And I've got 15 years of dividends for the equation. You, you want to go slowly into the process. Trying to sell at the high is not the aim. Trying to sell when it's got yeah, but it's all gone pear-shaped, that's that part of the process. That's what we're trying to achieve. And it comes back to being very clear we know what the falls are. The against are important because they keep us honest, they keep us focused. But this, this is what really matters, the stuff on the fall side. That's what got us into the stock, and that's what keeps us in the stock. And when things start to break in this prospect, and to your point on GDP, GDP has mean growth prospects for City Lodge have been pretty much zero for the last five or six years. The price brands have worked. Their properties have worked incredibly well. Hotels as a business are great because they're very much a, a leveraged operation again. You know, extra person rocks up at your hotel, that revenue straight to bottom line because you didn't have to employ an extra cleaner or an extra this, that, or all the rest. But sometimes you do need to panic. And knowing that distinction is actually quite simple. You feel it in your gut. If you held Steinhoff in the morning of 6 December last year, and you saw that price, and you saw that sense announcement, you knew that the shit just got real. Excuse the language. You knew it. You felt it. Whereas when Walmart arrives, you're like, sure, what's this? And the feeling is fundamentally different. You're like, is this or is this not bad? When you look at it and you say, this is quantifiably zero question, end of story, terrible, then you panic. And what do you do when you panic? You just get the heck out of Dodge, which in the case of Steinhoff means you sold a 22 Rand in the morning of, of, of 6 December instead of the current Rand and change. Now, 22 Rand was not a good price, but it is exactly 22 times better than the one Rand you're going to get in the next week or two. And ultimately, you're going to get zero for your Steinhoffs. Someone asked me on TV on Monday or Tuesday, should they buy a Steinhoff? The answer is simple. No. Take your money to the casino because the drinks are free. There are no drinks for holding Steinhoff. Last point, which is critically important, is lightning. The best thing about Capitec is that it's gone from my average price in Capitec is 26 Rand, and that share is 900 Rand. It's, what, a 40-something bagger. That's absolutely wonderful. The truth of the matter is that having bought Capitec in 2009, I bought a 20 Rand, 30 Rand, and 40 Rand. Having bought it in 2009, I have been a net seller ever since because it becomes too big in my portfolio. There have been times when Capitec has been 46% of my portfolio. I love Capitec, but I don't sleep well when one shares 46%. Now, in truth, if I had never sold a Capitec in my life, I'd be markedly richer today. But what happens if you did that with Steinhoff? And this is a debate I have all the time about lightening those. What you're essentially doing is you're selling your winners, and that's the stupidest thing in the world. The other side of the coin is you sleep well at night and you're reducing the overall risk to your portfolio. So when I buy a stock for the first time, 8 to 10% of that death drust part goes into the share. In other words, it's chunky. I only have 10 or 12 shares in that part of the portfolio, so it's a chunky position. I'm happy to carry on adding to it until it's 20% in that part of the portfolio. Remember, there's 30% in my death drust part. Between 20 and 30, I don't add but I don't sell. When I hit 30%, I'm going to start selling some, some stocks. Gently, I'm not in a hurry. So my Capitex recently hit 30% again when they breached 990 Rand in December. And I did nothing. And I went to 1,098 and I did nothing. And then Viceroy arrived and I quickly sold some at 911 and got them back into weight. One way you can manage that overweight process is obviously there's cash coming into the portfolio from dividends. You're putting money in. So you're putting money into other shares, and that pulls down the weight of the big shares. But if you hit a Capitec, it's just, I mean, I bought Capitec, as I said, at 20 Rand. Literally a week later, it was 30, and a month later, it was 40. And in the year I bought it, it went from 20 to 90. 
That's 450% in a year. It's a lovely thing to happen, except that your little 10% holding suddenly is a 40% holding in one year. And if it then suddenly goes all the way back down, then you're in trouble. So, and then they did, so what the, initially what I did, every time they did a rights issue, they did a rights issue at 125, I took my no paids, I sold them. They did a rights issue at 175, I took my no paids, and then I sold them. And then they went sideways for about three years or so at around the 200 level. And that helped unwind the process. And then when African bank collapsed, they came back to 200, and that helped unwind the process. But then they went off and stormed up to 1100 again and became massively overweight. ETFs, I haven't touched on them at all because ETFs are simple. Buy, hold, buy more. First 33000 into your tax-free account every year. Key point is understand we need to get back to the theory of long term is really decades, not Christmas. Or maybe Panica, or maybe even something that's even sooner. What's the story, not the price. The price will hurt you, but the story is what matters. Because you're not going to get the price right anyway and sit at the top. So know that story. What's critically important is know why you bought it. What is it that makes this the company you decided to buy as opposed to the company you decided not to buy? That is the key distinction. And if you're thinking, well, I bought it because Wayne McCurry said it's a good share, you need better reasons. Write it down. Keep the journals. It forces you to think. Do the homework. And don't stress that we're going to get it wrong sometimes. I mean, make no bones. I've got it wrong plenty enough times. The losers aren't the worries. The beauty about investing in the stock market is if you buy something, if you bought Steinhoff at 90 Rand, you have lost 100% of your money. That's terrible. But you've only lost 100% of your money. If you bought Capitec at 20, at, 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 at 20 Rand, you've made 4,500%. Asymmetrical return. Your downside is limited to 100%. Your upside, no limit. Of course, we want to try and avoid the 100% losers. Let's rather make them 50 or, you know. But if you do occasionally end up with the Steinhoff or an African bank, and you will, you absolutely will. It, it, it's, it's, if it hasn't happened, it's just waiting to happen. I know that's the bad news for the day. But that's just 100% loss. That's fine. You, as long as you've got someone on the other side, they can outweigh it.